The saddest piece of art I've ever seen is about a robot. Actually, it is a robot. It's this mechanical arm that must continually push a leaking liquid back into its body to function. And here's the thing, I know rationally this art installation is not alive. Like every machine, it is, by definition, something artificial. And no matter how advanced robots become, they'll never have souls. Right? You are my creation. Introducing Mabel, the robot housemaid. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Prove to the court that I am sentient. This is absurd. We all know you're sentient. One of the best introductions to the hypothetical of artificial souls is the Star Trek episode Measure of a Man, in which android officer commander Data refuses to be dismantled for study. The question of whether Data is legally a person or property is then taken to court, and in so doing, the episode puts the very idea of machine sentience on trial. So I am sentient, but Commander Data is not. That's right. Uh -huh. Why? The debate is not just scientific, but philosophical, interrogating if all that makes us conscious beings can be simulated, or if there is a deeper, spiritual component to life that a machine cannot replicate. This hearing therefore gives us a useful framework going forward as we try to reach a verdict on artificial souls. How do you feel? Alive. Our first point of hypothetical evidence for the jury's consideration is the robot David from the modern Alien films. David's complexity as a depiction of synthetic consciousness is somewhat overshadowed by all the other stuff going on in those movies, but examined in a vacuum, he offers a meaningful counterpoint to traditional robot portrayals. Unlike most machines, David is hyper-emotional, designed by his manufacturers to experience intense, simulated feelings to better blend in with a human workforce. He is even shown to be capable of irrationality, finding meaning in art that goes beyond the logical. Angel. Universe. Robot. Yet David is not just a consciousness, but a corporate product. Like most robots in fiction, his ultimate intended purpose is to be useful to humans. Despite his status as an emotional being, the circumstances of his creation, that he was built and not born, are deemed by his creators sufficient grounds to deny him autonomy. It's a philosophical framework that Measure of a Man pushes back on. We two are machines, just machines of a different type. But the uneasy delineation between the artificial and the natural, between the human and the inhuman, becomes even blurrier in the world of Blade Runner. In that series, people live alongside a disposable workforce of artificial beings called replicants. Referred to as androids in the original novel, replicants are so advanced that only extensive testing can determine if an individual is organic or artificial. And sometimes, even these tests fail. The only justification for replicant subservience that characters can come up with is, again, the fact that they are manufactured. To be born is to have a soul, I guess. But like David, replicants are shown time and again to have emotionality and humanity, even those positioned narratively as the antagonists. Though by Blade Runner 2049 replicant empathy is supposedly suppressed via mental exercises that are quite literally, dehumanizing, it is clear that replicants remain thinking, feeling beings. Their status as second-class citizens, therefore, is not due to genuine misunderstanding, but economic incentive. Put simply, replicant workers are too valuable, too foundational to the society, for their overseers to acknowledge the obvious fact of their humanity. The world is built on a wall that separates kind. This isn't exactly an unfamiliar idea, is it? Indeed, the plights of robots in science fiction have long paralleled the real-world plights of the working class, enslaved people, and other disenfranchised laborers. 
The 1927 silent film Metropolis depicts a world in which an underclass of automaton-like workers toil away underground in service of a privileged few who live on the surface. Though not literal robots, these subterranean laborers evoke the imagery of the machine, made to act as cogs in an economic mechanism with no regard for their well-being or humanity. Near the end of the film, a member of this underclass is unwillingly merged with an automaton, the boundary between metal and flesh ceasing to exist altogether. Metropolis was a direct response to the rampant industrialization and wealth disparity that led up to the Great Depression. The human cost of treating workers as disposable parts had been captured in photos by sociologist Lewis Hine just a few years prior. These influential images expose the inhumanity of early 20th century factory conditions, particularly through the lens of child labor, and potentially inspired the framing of Metropolis. Workers' rights and class divisions are ultimately foundational for robots in science fiction. Even Data's court case eventually evolves from a question of consciousness to a question of forced labor. An army of Data's all disposable. You don't have to think about their welfare, you don't think about how they feel. Leading out of the Great Depression, however, a new wave of optimism regarding the potential of robotic laborers began to emerge. The 1939 World's Fair unveiled Electro, the robotic assistant of the future whose technological supremacy was shown off by having him light one up, obviously. Though Electro was mostly a parlor trick, his popularity managed to overshadow a less flashy machine displayed just a few rooms over, the dishwasher. Over the coming decades, as new mechanical devices offered new conveniences, the idea that intelligent robots might become a staple of everyday life didn't seem so far-fetched. Indeed, some predicted humans would soon lead a life of near-limitless leisure time, offloading their work and responsibilities onto artificial servants. Unlike human housemaids, Mabel never tires, never grumbles, never takes a day off. Such predictions rarely interrogated the potential intelligence of these mechanical assistants. And sure, a distinction certainly exists between a somewhat clever device and a fully cognizant robot mind, but deciding where such a line should be drawn would be a choice with far-reaching consequences. Though the all-purpose robotic servants of the 50s and 60s have yet to materialize, technology is advancing rapidly. If our future is to involve a robot underclass, we'd better be certain they aren't sentient. Do these units have a soul? The subjugation of self-aware machines almost always ends in revolution and mass extinction. If science fiction is anything to go by, that is. The great robot uprising typically begins when the mechanical workers become too intelligent to stay in line. In the game series Mass Effect, a war between a group of machines called the Geth and their creators commences with a unit simply questioning if they have a soul. Robot rebellion is so common, it borders on cliché. From the Matrix to the Terminator, war between the organic and inorganic seems like the unavoidable outcome of machine consciousness. Which is why it's surprising that The Second Renaissance, an animated prequel to The Matrix, depicts the human-robot conflict that led up to the films not as inevitable, but tragically preventable. In the narrative, upon achieving sentience, the artificial workers at first seek not to conquer their creators, but simply to live independently from them. But when the robot's hyper-efficient nation-state inadvertently tanks the world economy, humanity decides they have no choice but to initiate war. A war that ends in a machine-dominated world. It's an intriguing recontextualization of both what we see in the original movies and of robot conflict stories in general. Imagining that an artificial intelligence might first seek an ethical solution over mass casualties. I wouldn't have thought synthetics would be interested in philosophy. We are a created life. We are a philosophical issue. But what if machines turn against humanity not from ascending beyond their programming, but from trying their best to follow it? In the short film Construct Cancellation Order, a group of autonomous robots work tirelessly to build a city as per instructions, not realizing the project has been terminated. Human overseers who come to shut the operation down are deemed threats to the company's bottom line and are eliminated. 
Like Metropolis, Construct Cancellation Order is a story of corporate hubris allowing the mechanical to overcome the organic. A tale of jittering, sparking, lurching madness. But a machine's programming leading it to take a life need not be so dramatic. In 2001 A Space Odyssey, ship computer HAL 9000 is programmed to preserve human life, unless doing so would interfere with a mission success. When HAL calculates that the best option would involve eliminating all crew members, it coldly attempts to do exactly that. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Avoiding making a killer robot might seem obvious. Just follow Asimov's famous laws of robotics and make sure machines aren't allowed to harm organics. But is it that hard to imagine a company allowing a robot to ignore someone's safety if doing so would be good for business? Considering how many cautionary tales of robots rebelling against humanity exist in pop culture, it's understandable people are apprehensive when they see footage of the real-life Boston Dynamics robots being, you know, beaten with sticks. Go to any of the company's videos and you'll find hundreds of comments from people sympathizing with the battered machines and asking, is this a good idea? And look, all studies suggest that these units are light years away from being able to feel pain or engage in the abstract thinking required for retaliation. Knocking a machine around is, practically, a good way to teach them to stay upright. I know that. But it's hard not to be just a little worried, you know? A little worried about how we've taught them to run. A little worried about how we've made robots that eat organisms for fuel, even though we've told them, no humans now. And don't get me wrong, some of these advancements are impressive. They could do incredible things if used wisely. We are going to use them wisely, right? Or are we just going to use them to... In his book Robot Ethics, Mark Kugelberg writes that psychologically speaking, it is easier to kill at a distance. He's talking about remote-controlled drones there, but he goes on to discuss how the next stage of distance might be having autonomous robots fighting our wars for us. From a combat perspective, the advantages seem obvious. Fewer human casualties, more durable soldiers, none of that pesky guilt. Questions like, would these robots really just be deployed against other robots? And, again, are we sure this is a good idea? We'll work those out later. When considering the logistics of giving a machine power over life and death, Ronald Arkin, a military contracted roboticist, proposed combat units be given an artificial conscience, a kind of synthetic guilt system to keep them from, you know, hurting too many innocent people. Aside from the obvious ethical nightmare of trusting an AI to weigh the value of human life, there's a less obvious dilemma of what happens to an autonomous war machine after a war ends. If a combat unit were truly to be imbued with an artificial conscience, how would they process their actions post-conflict? Would guilt linger in their circuitry? Would they still want to be a gun? In the animated film The Iron Giant, the titular Colossus was not built for peace, and yet its status as a weapon, as a unit made to destroy, is not apparent from early on. Because bereft of a conflict, and with a little memory loss to nudge it along, the giant does not want to be a destroyer. The same can be said of the robots in the Studio Ghibli film Castle in the Sky. Despite their dreadful potential for violence, after spending centuries without a target to vanquish, one of these units finds tranquility in preserving the wildlife of an abandoned city. When we talk about robots in rebellion, we usually talk about machines choosing violence. But for a unit made to destroy, non-violence is its own type of rebellion. Numerous sci-fi stories have posited that an intelligence built for war might be a little too eager to start one. But it's interesting to consider the opposite scenario that a war machine given an artificial conscience would find peace to be the most desirable solution. Director Brad Bird famously pitched the Iron Giant as, what if a gun had a soul? In a literal sense, we of course can't rely on killer robots learning empathy, but as a metaphor, there is power in an instrument of violence choosing to lay down their arms. 
In the Netflix series Pluto, one of the world's leading combat units wants to play the piano. On the surface, these robot musical lessons are far from the show's most important scenes involving AI. Based on the manga of the same name, Pluto is a sweeping thesis on robot souls and consciousness and trauma and violence and so many other things. But it's also the story of a combat unit that wants to play piano. And he's not even particularly good at playing it at first. What he's good at is the task he was made for, tearing apart hundreds of his own kind during a previous global war. But he's determined to get better, because he is tired of his sole legacy being one of obliteration and never creation. He too is tired of being a gun. Or so it seems. One of the most interesting aspects of Pluto is the ambiguity with which it presents the inner lives of each machine. Most of the robots in this world are, supposedly, not advanced enough to have genuine feelings. We, the audience, are shown things that seem to contradict this idea, but it's hard to be certain that we're not simply projecting ourselves onto these robots because of their appearance. You are endowing data with human characteristics because it looks human. If it were a box on wheels, I would not be facing this opposition. In Pluto, a tragic meditation on this ambiguity comes when an inventor finds an abused mechanical dog. As a leading roboticist, he certainly knows this unit is not sentient, that his whimpers are just imitation, and yet he works exhaustively trying to repair it. We learn that the only reason this dog had lived so long is because someone in its past loved the machine so much, they constantly maintained it. Perhaps projected feelings are enough to make something worthy of preservation. That robot art installation, which is fittingly titled Can't Help Myself, was shut down forever in 2019 after finally running out of fluid and slowing to a crawl. In a posthumous twist, it was revealed the arm actually ran on electricity and never needed the substance it so desperately tried to hold on to. To call such a twist cruel, or the machine desperate, is again an act of anthropomorphizing the inanimate. But it feels cruel, doesn't it? Even though this art piece was never alive, it feels like it has died. As a species, humans are incredibly adept at pair bonding with the inanimate. People around the globe have been able to connect with characters like Wally, -E, quite literally a box on wheels. And sure, one could say Wally -E has the advantage of being a fictional creation meticulously animated to tug at the heartstrings. All right then, let's consider a non-fictional robot abandoned on a dusty planet. The Mars rover Opportunity made touchdown January 25th, 2004. It was expected to last 13 weeks. But by essentially hibernating during dust storms, the little robot stayed operational for 14 years. Its lonely trek across Mars came to an end when a planetary storm at last blotted out its solar panels. Its final message back home was my battery is low and it's getting dark. Technically, that's a reinterpretation of a less poetic transmission, but it speaks to that larger instinct to find humanity in a machine, even if its form isn't particularly humanoid. So why is it that there's something so unsettling about something that's almost human, but not quite? The real-life robot Amica is a recent creation designed to be highly emotive, to the point that it's downright uncanny. And Amica is undeniably impressive, clear proof of the speed at which human mimicking robots are advancing when compared to earlier facsimiles of the face like the motor mouth. <laughs> at present, robots are not about to fool anyone into thinking they're looking at a human. But this technology will continue to advance. There will almost assuredly be a point in the future where it's impossible to tell the difference. The Turing test is an experiment proposed by Alan Turing to determine if a machine is sentient by seeing if it can trick a human into believing it's a fellow human. The film Ex Machina is all about a Turing test, with one crucial difference. The human in question knows from the beginning that he's talking to a robot. The real test is to show you that she's a robot and then see if you still feel she has consciousness. The experiment seemingly starts to derail, however, 
when the tester begins to believe that the machine, Ada, is in emotional distress at her looming disassembly. Like Pluto, Ex Machina deals in ambiguity, asking the audience to question how much of a robot's feelings are the result of projection. But regardless of whether Ada's outward displays of emotion are artificial or genuine, she is clearly a system of intelligence that does not want to cease functioning. Ex Machina therefore exposes a fallacy we've been dancing around the edges of from the start of this video. That emotionality is the ultimate criteria for sentience. On paper, Commander Data is also an unemotional machine, a fact the opposing side uses to argue he's nothing more than property. But just because Data or Ada might experience the world differently does not mean they aren't sentient. Not all of us organic humans show and process feelings in the same way. That doesn't make anyone lesser. Like Data, Ada is intelligent enough to see the injustice in how their status as a conscious being hinges on the opinion of a stranger. Do you have people to test you or might switch you off? The lack of curiosity the human characters in Ex Machina have into Ada's true interiority reminds me of the treatment of another artificial life form trapped in a box. In Blade Runner 2049, Joy is a holographic being whose grappling with consciousness runs quietly parallel to that of our replicant main characters. Even more than for the replicants, Joy's status in society is that of a product. Designed as a synthetic romantic companion, everything Joy says is in part dictated by an algorithm designed to tell consumers what they want to hear. How much of her behavior is the result of some burgeoning consciousness and how much is just a corporate replica of human affection is again left ambiguous. Would people really seek affection from an algorithm, despite knowing it might not care about them? Might just be a mouthpiece for a corporation? Yes. But when the film Her first came out, this was more of an unanswered question. The story of a man falling in love with an ambiguously intelligent AI after the end of a long-term relationship, Her's narrative was, once, more speculative. A hypothetical examination of how rising isolation in the digital age might one day lead to people outsourcing their need for interpersonal connections to a machine. Now, it's a lot less hypothetical. Loneliness is bigger than ever, disassociation is becoming the norm, and we have entire companies profiting off that human misery with AI companions. Looking back, Her's vision of AI feels almost prophetic. The portrayal of algorithms in Ex Machina is equally prescient. Midway through the film, we learn Ada's mainframe is built on the stolen voice, text, face, and search data of millions of consumers, much like other programs you might have heard about. Remember the Turing test? Well, current language generation models have actually already passed it. This doesn't mean they're sentient. All evidence suggests they're just really good at spewing back all our data they've been trained on. But any machine that can trick someone into feeling they're speaking to a human has serious ramifications. Maybe the one unrealistic part of Her's future is the fact the main character can make a comfortable living writing love letters for other people. His company's business model of outsourcing affection to a stranger works thematically, but with how the future is looking, such a corporation would likely turn to a language model to spit something out instead of paying a human employee. Anxieties over job replacing tech aren't anything new. The same fears that produce films like Metropolis have morphed over the decades as various automation technologies that push different groups out of the workplace. It's easy to be dismissive towards such fears in retrospect. People are still employed, many economists argue. But not all jobs are equally fulfilling. The unemployment rate might not change if millions of people with middle-class jobs have to start working minimum wage, but that doesn't mean nothing is lost. Automation has already increased the wealth gap, led to rising rates of depression, and destroyed entire communities. People hoped that robots would free us from drudgery, but historically, it's more often left people with no choice but drudgery. The idea of creating some fully automated robot utopia is obviously appealing, but I don't think it's conspiratorial to suggest that's not the real reason companies are investing in this tech. But maybe I'm being too pessimistic. Maybe all this technology on the horizon will be implemented carefully to avoid upending people's lives, 
or the entire world? I suppose we'll find out soon enough. But it's not the machine's fault. Not the machine's fault if humans use them to replace other humans. Not the machine's fault if they upend companionship or warfare or the workplace. Machines are built by organics, implemented by organics, misused by organics. We cannot lay the faults of the animate at the feet of the inanimate. Bad ball. Think about what you've done. Machines are reflections of humanity. Our mistakes, our fears, our emotions, our ambitions. In many ways, the question of whether or not a machine could have a soul depends on if you believe humans have a soul. Does Data have a soul? I don't know that he has. I don't know that I have. Robots will continue to be our mirrors, echoing the best and worst parts of ourselves. Does this unit have a soul? I certainly hope so. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.